Waiting. I'm going to wait until that little loading thingy is stopped loading on my screen because I don't want to launch into all of the intro until everyone on YouTube can see it. Cool. Okay. Well, we should be live now on Otter AI and on YouTube. I'll pop the Otter AI link into here. And um, Ismail, can you add the YouTube link as well into um, the chat, please? That would be very handy. So, hey, everyone. This is the last graduation call of OLS 6, uh, early 2023. If you, there is still time to apply for OLS 7, if you're watching and you're thinking, goodness me, these people have done amazing things, which you will. Um, anyway, we are going to start with the presentations momentarily. I will just remind everyone, whether you're watching on YouTube or whether you're watching through Zoom directly at the moment, that we have a code of conduct where we ask one, uh, people who are participating in our spaces to treat each other respectfully and kindly. Um, this is something designed to protect the marginalized people in our community and make people feel welcome and belonging. Um, so if at any point you feel like this hasn't happened, either something you've witnessed or something you experienced, then you can report that by emailing team at openlifesci.org, which reaches the organizers team, that's several people. Or if you would rather reach an individual, then you can always email yo at openlifesci.org, Berenice, Malvika, Paz, or Emmy, right. um, so that you can reach them individually. Um, I'm just going to sneakily use some of my mute powers here, just if you are not speaking at the moment so that your cat's meowing or the truck nearby doesn't go on YouTube, um, just try and keep on mute unless it's time to speak. Uh, we do love hearing you speak, so don't don't feel afraid that you can't. Um, I am going to stop yammering. Uh, Ismail, do you want to head into the uh, organizing presentations and take us away? Sure. Hello, everyone. Welcome and congrats for amazing work over the past so very many weeks. Uh, you made it. Um, we're going to be hearing from what seems to be six or seven presentations, so we're going to have to uh, cut Q and A's for today. Um, you have five minutes each to present. I will uh, tell you when we met, hit the five minute mark, and we'll try and keep it within five minutes. The first talk is going to be by uh, Nilaba. Do you have a, sh a screen to share? Yes, I do. Let me just get that sorted. Brilliant. Awesome. Uh, I'm loud and clear. I'm visible, all that stuff. Looking great. Take it away. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Hi, everybody. Hello. Good evening. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Nilab Mukherjee. I am a pre final student who's pursuing a degree in bioengineering here in India. And this journey with OLS began with a simple question in my mind. Is that how can open life science change the career path that I go to in the coming future? So I say that this project was born out of a necessity for me because I wanted to understand where I will be in the next four years. And that's what I exactly did. Oh, one second. That's what I exactly did. With September, the first thing that came to my mind was the sheer limitless possibilities of where I did this project with. The project understanding the open life science landscape in India is an abstract thought. It's a thought. It's a philosophy that we can potentially guide as we see fit. And that's what I was thinking come September. When, I, when November reached, that is when I started understanding that the best way to move forward is to make it a public project. And with, my, with the help of my mentor, Miss Anne Treasure, we, we, sorted, we started working on a public repository on GitHub, uh, which uh, the links, are, the links are available on the Etherpad, which strived its best to document all the questions that I had asked and all the conversations that I ha had with individuals over this entire experience. In January, I began thinking of what the end game could be. Because after all, the journey matters as much as the destination, right? Destination could be, became very much important to me because when I was a student, I had questions as in, do I want to do a master or do I want to become, choose the entrepreneurial side or do I want to join a community and give my life to it because I'm willing to. And so that's what I was thinking. Like, what could my end game be? So as I have five minutes, let me quickly jump to the most important aspect of my OLS experience. And that is the human practices. 
human practices was vital for my project simply because, I, because as a student i failed to grasp how open science helps active researchers and that's when i that's when i clicked i am a college going student and i have access to these wonderful faculties who will help me understand what open life science has done for them and that is why i approached three specific faculties the first individual that i approached is one professor from microbiology his name is dr mendan butler gonda and he has a treasure trove of experience in academic and industry research and he highlighted three specific points regarding what open science stands for in the indian population and how my solution which in its in its very simple form as a handbook or a guide stands to help individuals and finally he asked a very interesting question to me is that do we even need your project because after all unless the project stands to help or support existing undergraduates then i fail to do my initial goal the project that i have and the way i presented to him was the conversation of actually publishing a handbook a guide for undergraduates in india to navigate the open life sciences landscape from the fresher year to the final year now why is this important in india in india there are numerous communities that stand and support the same concept of open life science but they operate independently this operation matrix that exists in india is often detrimental for undergraduates who want to understand a bigger picture and that is exactly what dr mahendran introduced me to the second individual that i spoke was was dr lavin she is an after igm mentor and also has worked with numerous as numerous individuals as a consultant as well that she talked about how you have to reduce barriers to ensure that the project is more accessible and that is when i began to understand the importance of a github repository to discuss what i have achieved and what i should be achieving and finally what she clarified was was a very important aspect as what could your potential stakeholders need so with her guidance what i'm trying to do in me uh, as we speak is develop customer profiles of potential stakeholders to my project and also how i can start looking at a potential team why did i mention team because the concept of a team is very important that is what my final professor introduced me to her name was her name is dr neetu and she talked about how making this project a successful endeavor having a exceptional team is important and so the biggest goal have going forward to my end game is to find figure out potential contributors and how this project can take off finally before for, for the final section that i want to talk to you guys all about is basically a basically a timeline of what i did over the past few months in september the biggest uh, in september what i did is i approached numerous communities to understand what are they facing in the sense what are the potential concerns that they have in terms of open science and how undergraduates fail to understand this opportunity and i simply began by asking google is what is happening in india and how can i be a part of it come october i that, that, that's when yeah, i yeah, please that's rush. five minutes i'll wrap it up thank uh, you so yes uh, let me just quickly wrap that up yes there are three key takeaways of my project and that's how i want to wrap it up first publishing the undergraduate guide to life science research and industry in india second build a join a community of potential contributors to make sure that this facility are available to undergraduates and finally recommend ways to improve scientific communication in india and with that thank you so much and i'm open to questions and your comments amazing thank you so much thank you um, so much Well done! Congratulations! If you can stop sharing your screen, we'll get yes. an image of everyone sharing, um, uh, applauding. A huge round of applause for Nilawa. Um, congrats um, on on amazing work over the past many weeks. Um, we have the Etherpad where we can share questions. Uh, Nilawa, take a look in case questions appear uh, throughout the. Will do. chat and and later on uh, for now we're going to go on to uma who's presenting on open science community nigeria uh hello everyone there you go thank you yeah hello everyone um i am umar here um presenting you on open science community nigeria where it's uh a colleague of mine Khadija who is based in Malaysia currently Khadija 
Hi, good evening. Good evening. My name is presenting with Umar. Okay. Um, uh, just to um, a kind of motivations, uh, what actually inspire us to establish open science community because of the movements of open science uh, around the global stage. And open science is actually so new in Nigeria. And uh, we decided, okay, because we don't have this community established in Nigeria, and then uh, we come off with the open science community uh, Nigeria, which we have the Twitter handles here, as you can see. So our major vision for uh, uh, establishing the open science community in Nigeria is basically to reach as many researchers as possible as we can to engage them and the community of researchers, clinicians, stakeholders, and students in Nigeria to inspire them and enable uh, the discussions of open science among Nigerians in order to help in improving the quality of our own research output. So working together, we will want to embed the open science practice in Nigerian community. So um, it was founded actually in April 2022. Uh, I think during my uh, OLS5, uh, along the way, I, I, I got this idea of developing this open science uh, community in, in Nigeria. Uh, and from there, we actually opened the repository in GitHub. Uh, you can see the profiles of the open science there. And then in June 2022, we also created a repository in Zenodo where we actually fostered some of the uh, talks that we were invited by the African Society for Computational Biology. Um, in April, um, uh, in June, the same June, so we actually organized our first workshop in data transformations and analysis using R. And this is actually uh, a cross sections of um, the participants who actually attended our first and second workshop. One is in Bochi State University here in Nigeria. And the second one is in Abu Bakr Tupapale University, Bochi, Nigeria. Um, uh, in August 2022, we joined the International Network of Open Science Community and Scholarships to better understand how we can run the open science community in Nigeria. And uh, we had the membership in the same August uh, where we have <clears throat> uh, a network of communities. We interacted with a network of uh, international community of open science. Uh, they are actually located mostly in Netherlands, about 12 locations in Netherlands, one in Sweden, one in yeah, Ireland, and one in Saudi Arabia, and another one, uh, the recently founded uh, open science community in Serbia. Then uh, in September, we also joined the Open Science Community Incubator programs. That was actually uh, the first programs initiated by the International Network of Open Science and Open Science Scholarships. There we participated, we attended these programs and we learned uh, based on these models, we learned how to actually develop missions and mission statements, just like the way we did it and, and learned together in the Open Life Science Community. We also launched community engagements, communication strategy, uh, stakeholders engagements, monitoring and sustainability, uh, uh, and more in the uh, uh, Open Science uh, Community Incubator. So um, here uh, in, in January recently, we had uh, this uh, library science that actually uh, decided they want to sponsor the uh, development of our website and currently the website is under development uh, and we hope to launch it soon. Uh, so at this juncture, I think I would like to hand over to uh, Khadija who will continue from here. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, Khadija here. Uh, so based on what we have learned so far, we plan to utilize uh, this uh, um, knowledge we uh, acquire to be able to achieve uh, the set actions we want to take in the next uh, first and second quarter of uh, 2023, which is to complete and launch the website and also attract new members as well as engage the community and stakeholders. Uh, so based on, on that, we hope to achieve uh, more items on the list on the, set, on the third and fourth quarter of uh, 2023 that includes identifying sustainability plans as well as creating collaboration and partnership with other uh, member body. 
So currently the team is made of just Umar, myself, who is uh, the Northeast uh, coordinator and Sadiq. Uh, sorry, uh, Sadiq is a Northeast coordinator and as well as Mahmoud, who is the program coordinator. We Khadija, currently have back a- Khadija, that is five minutes. If you could try to wrap it up, please. All right, so uh, we currently have vacant uh, positions which we uh, uh, plan to fill uh, very soon, identifying uh, faculty members as well as students to fill in this uh, particular vacant position uh, to assist in uh, um, an awareness of uh, spreading awareness of open science across different institutions in Nigeria. So before I end, I would like to appreciate Caleb, who was our mentor. Uh, Joe, who is the founder of uh, African Pre uh, African uh, Preprint, but Tool, who is uh, the founder of Open Science, for her constant assistance and potential collaboration in the future. Uh, Mo and Mal uh, Malvika, as well as everybody who has assisted us in this program um, by broadening our knowledge and also increasing our visibility, especially in on Twitter. And we also finally want to appreciate all our open science supporters across um, Africa and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Well done. Um, it's really it's really good to hear that you got sponsorship for the um, website development. It looks like it's all going ahead. Um, exciting times. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen. Thank you. Thank you. And congrats and a huge round of applause from everyone around the room. Again, kind of reminder, there is an etherpad to put questions in. Presenters, feel free to look at questions later on. Um, again, tight with time. So we're going to go to um, the other Uma uh, for the next presentation. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. I'll share the um, can you? Okay, thank you. You see it? Yes. Yes, so uh, uh, like the uh, presenter said, my name is Umar Farouk Ahmad. So like, let's accept what you said, Umar Nuclear. Uh, I'm here to present uh, my uh, oldest project uh, mentored by Jafsia LEC. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, here is how I'm going to do it. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the problem here we are facing in Nigeria is that uh, uh, documented, uh, we had uh, 4,000 X-ray equipment currently functioning in Nigeria as of 2018, uh, reported by the Radiographers Board of Nigeria. And uh, almost 5% uh, of these are only under reg uh, regulatory control. So we try to see, based on this, uh, let's uh, try to come up with a method to see how many of this equipment are there in Kano Metropolis, as Kano is uh, the most populous uh, uh, state in Nigeria. So based on what is on ground, the data that the radiographers Board of Nigeria shared with us, uh, they said that they had uh, 41, uh, uh x-ray equipment so uh and all these uh 41 uh many of them are not uh, under regulatory control so and the this uh this uh, process is that there will be increased risks of uh, patient mismanagement i would like to go technical here if you permit me for some seconds so as to understand the danger of it for example if a machine x-ray equipment has last for let's say two years so it's supposed to undergo quality control, let's say quarterly or yearly. So if it didn't take, uh, if it hasn't passed through this QC quality control for like, uh, say, uh, uh, three to four years. So maybe, for example, if uh, the radiographer is trying to get an image, he put like, let's say, 20 kilo voltage, which will dissipate, let's say, 0 0.01 millisievert. So the machine might, when you, the radiographer put that 20, the machine might dissipate 20 millisievert, who knows? So that's why this type of QC and QA need to be taking place. So this will uh, 
lead to unnecessary radiation exposure to patients. Next slide, please. So uh, this is our solution. We propose using machine learning and AI algorithm to predict uh, the QA and QC status of the equipment. So this uh, project will tend to have like open source and we get reliable and affordable QA tool combining AI and ML and also generate uh, uh, useful data. Next, please. <clears throat> So uh, here is the progress and vision of the project. First uh, project documentation and GitHub, which has been done. And also during our survey to confirm the data we collected uh, from radiographers part of Nigeria, uh, we survey diagnostic centers that use uh, X-ray in Kano metropolis, metropolis comprising of uh, eight local governments. So we, find out, we found out that uh, the number that the radiographers part of Nigeria uh, reported 41, and the present situation that uh, we find found that there are currently uh, 292 X-ray equipment. You see, that's the different margin. That is a bigger big gap uh, because uh, had it been this data is open, uh, people will be contributing towards this increase. Uh, the next, uh, we will try to create a project website uh, so as to create a community to share and uh, <clears throat> to share. Uh, resources and uh, also share knowledge. So the next is uh, to obtain parameters using Q QA dosimeters. As you can see, there is a stop there. So uh, we liaise with uh, uh, the current radiation safety officers that have these dosimeters. However, uh, uh, we realize that okay, now the problem of why people are not doing QA and QC is because of the expensive nature of this uh, procedure. So that's where the point we are. Uh, and we tend to create uh, this uh, project. When we get this data, we'll go, uh, uh, we'll get, we'll, we'll create a project data set and apply the AI, mod, uh, AI model. We keep training the algorithm. And next, we get develop this uh, toolkit. Next slide, please. So, as you can see by the right, here is uh, the type of equipment needed, which are the multifunction meter and also ion chamber. So uh, we couldn't get, uh, we're in the process on seeing how to secure funding uh, to see if we can get this equipment to get these uh, parameters. Uh, also, <clears throat> uh, challenges. The challenges we are facing when we are collecting a large amount of data when tackling a completely new tax can be challenging to say the least because you need to uh, go from center to center so as to get the, reli uh, uh, the reli a reliable data for you. And also we realized that, okay, the reason why these radiation safety officers are not even uh, lending us their equipment to use is because that of this uh, Nigerian nuclear regulatory radiation protection cost for RSOs. Uh, if we can get sponsorship to do this cost, it will help. And also funding for this uh, uh, equipment. Uh, um, next slide, that, please. That, it, that is five minutes, if you can wrap up. Yes, I'm rounding up, I'm rounding up just now. So uh, my OLS experience has been so great. I've learned skills like open source project, uh, documentation of resources, GitHub, to say the list is uh, networking, uh, reaching out to people. As you can see, I was the banana man at uh, the recent COP. And this couldn't happen without the help of uh, uh, the OLS community for the crowdfunding, for sharing my cry on Twitter, and also, and uh, OLS 6 experience shows me that uh, everything is possible, that uh, no matter what the obstacle, you just have to keep going and uh, it's possible. Next slide, please, that last one. As you can see, I was able to even share my experience, thanks to you for connecting me to share my experience with the American Geophysical Union regarding open science and climate justice. And uh, during this trip, I was able to meet with uh, uh, the Secretary of Energy of the United States and also the uh, Department of Energy uh, in, uh, in uh, United Kingdom. Next slide, please. I think that's all. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, especially uh, you. Uh, there are so many adventures behind my visa and other things. Thank you so much. And my mentor, he has been patient with uh, all my travels and uh, all things. So thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to collaborating and getting this uh, work done in the future. Thank you so much.
Brilliant. Thank you so much for presenting. Um, it's it's such an such an applicable project. It's great. You're making real change. I love it. Um, huge round of applause. Congrats to you, Uma. Uh, well done um, on all the great work over the past few weeks and the work to come. It looks like you're uh, you're setting yourself up for a long project, uh, an exciting one. Um, next presentation is from Shamim. Are you able yes, to? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see my screen? In a moment. Yes. You okay. have it in. We can see the whole screen, right? Okay. Okay. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, my name is Shamim Sata from the University of Nairobi. Um, a master's a master's student in bioinformatics, and we did a project on as an, an open support resource for mental health among researchers in Kenya. And my mentor was Maya Tsukova. Um, so me, we 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 were narrowed down to postgraduate students. Um, mental health is uh, involves the emotional, social, social, and psychological well being. So it. it uh, affects how you think, how you feel, how you act. And uh, it also uh, determines how you respond to different uh, aspects of life. So it's one of the most important aspects in, our, in, our, in everyone's life, especially for a researcher. And postgraduate students face eight times higher rate of developing depression, anxiety uh, than, the normal, than the normal population. Some of the uh, mental health issues that Postgraduate faith, faith are imposter phenomenon, um, depression, anxiety, burnout, um, uh, the other mood disorders, yes. So uh, the problem stemmed from the fact that in Kenya, uh, we, we don't have any dedicated um, efforts or in, in initiatives in our uh, at academic institutions to to deal with mental health so there's a lot of mental health stigma um and then students are do not really know what what mental health is so most of them when you ask them it's they think back in time and they're like oh yeah that that was a mental health issue um so there's a lot of mental health literacy and it, there's also um the aspect of supervisor mentor relationships it's kind of tough here uh so it gets strained and then now it's uh, exacerbates the mental health issues among students. So uh, the objective of this project was to, sorry, can go to the next slide. Um, I don't know what's happening. Sorry, sorry. What is the game? Um, so the objective of this project was to create our, our awareness so by providing mental health literacy and sharing stories from experienced um, researchers and students who've gone through mental health and managed to overcome. And then we were targeting, we we're also aiming to build peer networks, a community of uh, established researchers and students who have handled mental health and can help others handle mental health issues. And then finally, Developing programs for mental health, healthcare, workshops, and a guideline for mentor mentee for healthy mentor mentee relationships. So, what we managed to do so far was we, we did a survey to assess the, the state of mental health among students and also start the discussions, like conversations on mental health. So, we got 26 responses. A majority of them were master students and one postdoc. And some of the issues we noted from the, the, the questionnaire was uh, there was high rates of depression, anxiety, and imposter phenomenon. And they were all tied to the intensity of the different programs, financial issues, lack of peer support, and, and the strained mental mental relationship. So some of the suggested solutions from the questionnaire were we need, we need to increase uh, mental health talks and also develop uh, approaches to improve mental mental relationships. So uh, to chat the way forward, we are working on increasing the, the story sharing. Uh, so we welcome anyone who's willing to share the stories on how they handled mental health 
um, established researchers or students. And then we are also, a, a community of peers is underway. We, we, are wel we welcome every, any collaborators who are willing to join um, uh, the, the community so that we can, we can uh, brainstorm on how to help uh, students with mental health issues. And then finally, we're working on an online, so far, we're working on an online workshop uh, on de demystifying mental health among postgraduate students and, and um, creating, also working on a team to create a template with guidelines that will help foster mental mentee relationships. Uh, we, uh, we welcome anyone who's willing to collaborate. You feel very welcome. Yes, you can reach out to me on my Twitter handle and also left links on the Etherpad. Thank you, OLS, and thank you for my very resourceful mentor, Meyer. And thank you for everyone else who participated in the, in the project. And thank you for keeping it under five minutes and also the amazing work. It's really important stuff. Thank you so much. Huge round of applause um, for excellent work that I know Maya can, can continue to support you on. Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot there, um, but well done. We'll go to the uh, next presentation now um, by Maya. Great. Um, <clears throat> let me share my screen. Just let me know when you can see it. There you go. Yeah. It's up. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah. Here I am to present you some reflections from OLS 6 cohort on the project I've been doing with Remo, um, which I renamed now to, to more what it is, Pan-European Background Summaries uh, Describing Mental Health of Researchers. Um, and it was it's nice to be after Shamim um, because she really laid out that mental health is, 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 is an issue. It's a delicate point for researchers in academia, but actually for all of us. Uh, and we are basically all on the same boat in this. And it, it's nice to see um, all the corporate, cooperative actions in order to, to tackle these issues. And REMO is one of such initiatives, is a, <clears throat> is a network of researchers and practitioners funded by Cost Action. Uh, which uh, works on European uh, and adjacent countries. And it focuses on well being and mental health in academia through activities such as networking, research, dissemination, training, and also engaging with policymakers. I'm really glad that Remo does this collaborative effort and puts uh, the, um, the results of these efforts online and open. For example, I, I'll put later on the etherpad, the links to the library, uh, the Terra Library of Articles on Mental Health, or all the reports and presentations are put on Zenodo and shared and, and many other projects uh, going on. So my journey with this um, project was that I joined um, the action in last year a teamwork uh, that was developing a large uh, multi-scale multinational survey to understand the status and factors uh, behind mental health of researchers. And it will be launched later this year and we are going to disseminate it. And call to action came to me when we realized that we don't have in one place uh, some kind of background summaries on mental health of researchers. And um, that's how I joined the, um, the virtual mobility grant scheme. And now I'm volunteering to bring this to, to the completion. And so what would be in that such a summary? Uh, after consulting um, various members and experts, we thought it is important to have in such a document what's in the news uh, in the country about mental health. Is it even in the news or uh, anything related to the career of research? So evidence, any data, any survey results, who are the stakeholders, what is the support system for mental health, 
what's the academic research structure, what's the funding, what's career structure, what's the legislation and policies. And all of these um, went to the exercise booklet for REMO ambassadors, which you can also consult and use, uh, for example, in devising your own uh, understanding of mental health in your country, and also the template, which is very long, but it, it's kind of an invitation to, to, to think of the, um, of the topic. The current status um, is that 18 countries are uh, kind of working <laughs> in progress. Uh, the yellow countries that are mapped, they are, said they um, would like to do it, um, but so far they haven't started. Uh, light green is, uh, there is work going on, something is being gathered, and the dark green, the Finland, is, is quite a completed summary, and we're really lucky and really thankful to to the contributor, Melina. Uh, so this role was quite open and agile and allowed me to engage and consult various members. Uh, let me be creative in setting the template and documentation processes and a lot of coordination, delegation and communication, communication, communication. And <laughs> don't laugh please, but actually writing a code of cool email was, was a very tough thing for me. Um, however, um, going through OLS, what I really would like to highlight for me um, as a learning is, um, yeah, is open leadership, is how assignments and reflection, especially the mentoring, uh, accompanied me in leaning more into my values and strengths and therefore not thinking of <laughs> limitations. However, it's been a constant search of balance a balance because of the risk of the projects as the result is totally dependent on others and on their ability to engage um, on the balance of between expertise of a person, their enthusiasm or time or willingness to contribute and people are really busy. And that is five minutes. Five minutes, great. Work. Yeah, um, and of course, a volunteer and paid work is something to take into account and the effects of work life on work life balance and mental health. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, the whole OLS, uh, my mentor Natalie, my mentee Shamim, because she is really doing a courageous um, effort project in Kenya, mental health, um, and people from Rama who were really important uh, for me to understand how it works. And yeah, please keep in touch and yeah, let's work on it. Thank you. Okay. Well done. Congrats. Um, Massive round of applause from everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great work, Maya, over the past. I, I like the mention of cold emails. No, they're not easy. They're kind of weird, aren't they? Um, uh, but well done um, for overcoming the challenge of cold emailing, but also the, the great work with it looks like Finland's leading the way. That's an interesting point. Um, the next talk is by, oh, you're already sharing your screen. Thank you, Nina. Hello. So we would like firstly to introduce ourselves. We are three students from different Irish universities. And for the first time we all met during the course where we were introduced to open science concepts. And because we wanted to make these concepts accessible to other PhD students and early career researchers, together uh, with students from uh, eight Irish and Danish universities, we decided to create this online course uh, for early career researchers, introducing them to open science. And we decided to call our initiative Agape. Agape means wide open, as is the open science philosophy and practice we want to promote. And the word agape originates from Greek and means love that is unconditional, such as our love for science. Uh, of course, we couldn't miss the opportunity to have this ape in awe as our agape logo. And uh, then we joined OLS with our project, Agape, building an open science practicing community in Ireland, because we wanted to learn about the theoretical and practical approaches to community building and maintenance. 
And from the very beginning, we would like to thank uh, our mentor, Sarah, who was very helpful because when we joined, we wanted to do everything. And Sarah really helped us to focus on the few main objectives that you can see here and to structure them and make them uh, into smaller steps that were that we were able to track and trace. So the first objective was to learn how to build and maintain the open science com practicing community. Then we wanted to learn how to improve knowledge and practice in open science at PhD and early career researchers level. And also it never harms to get some tips on how to get funding. So uh, to learn more about theoretical and practical approaches to community building, we wanted to hear success and failure stories of others who were attempting uh, this before us. Uh, of course, we wanted to get some tips on how to reach more PhD students and early career researchers, and also tips on some tools that we could use to maintain the community and empower contributors. So what we did, uh, we had a few interviews with experts and uh, we have been flabbergasted how open and genuinely willing to share their experience these were. And we decided also to tap into o OLS brain power in a form of a survey and uh, in Slack channel, questions on a Slack channel. And again, everyone was so helpful. We got so many useful tips. We are super grateful. And then, uh, then we wanted uh, to learn uh, how to improve knowledge and practice in open science and PhD and early career researchers level. And for this, we decided uh, to brainstorm on workshops. Again, we got so many useful tips on this. And uh, we are at the moment uh, building our website and blog site where every, everyone can share their experience and thoughts about open science. And uh, we established a collaboration platform that I'll get to in a minute and also launch this massive open online course that I mentioned before. So this is the screenshot from the course, how it looks. And what was great, uh, we also created a readme file uh, on GitHub about how to use this. And in the spirit of open science and OLS, we shared the documentation, practically a tool that template that someone can use because we integrated here a lot of features like automated certification, uh, certificate generation or quizzes, interactive quizzes that were not available before. And also we have a small bug reporting tool. And for the collaboration platform, we decided to use Metromost uh, and OLS was again very helpful because we were able to nail down our vision statement, code of conduct and contributor guidelines. And last but not least is our search of objectives when we were looking for tips on how to get funding. And you can see here some of them and we were super lucky because we get, got some tips on where to apply and how to apply for funding. And that's what we are going to try next. Thank you everyone for this amazing ride. It was really a pleasure. Uh, it was amazing and we hope this is not goodbye and this will go on. And here is how you can find and contact us as well as longer version of this presentation you can find on our GitHub account. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. To you and the team, well done. Congratulations and a massive round of applause, please. Um, right, Susanna's already on it. Okay. Uh, let's go on to the uh, next presentation. Okay. Okay. Um, so the title of my project was Ethical Standards and Reproducibility of Computer Models in Neurobiology because I that's what I do. I'm a PhD student who creates computer models of specific proteins in the brain to understand memory. And I wanted to look at the ethical standards and reproducibility of these models. I worked together with Open Life Sciences, the University of Edinburgh, which is my home university, and the Alan Turing Institute, where I'm currently an enrichment student. I like to give thanks at the beginning um, uh, to, to Shoban, who was my OLS mentor, uh, to Melanie, David, and Nicola, who are my PhD supervisors and have been really helpful all throughout the process. Claudia Fisher, who was of great guidance at the Alan Turing Institute. And then of course, everyone at OLS and anyone who came along the journey as well. 
So I'm going to give a brief um, background at the beginning. What was the aim and motivation? Then I'll let you know if I actually achieved the goals that I proposed for myself at the beginning. And finally, the outcomes of the project. So as a background, I thought uh, that what I wanted to do was uh, to offer a case study, so an example of how to create a PhD that looks at reproducibility and ethics as part of the process, not as an add-on. And I wanted to tackle reproducibility issues to stop wasting money, time, and resources in general um, due to reproducibility issues. And of course, I think, this is my opinion, but I think very strongly that um, reproducibility only makes sense if bias is accounted for as well. Otherwise, oppressive biases carry on without being questioned. And just as a quick um, definition of what I mean by bias here, I mean an inclination or pre prejudice for or against a certain group, especially in a way considered to be unfair. So, some of my main objectives, as I said, were to create a written guide for looking at bias and reproducibility in a PhD for other people to be able to use as an example. I did not manage to write a full guide, but I am in the process of embedding this as I write my thesis. So hopefully this should still be helpful for people in, in the future. Um, and when looking at bias, I had to um, zone in on one type of bias because there's a lot of them. There's racist, sexist, ableist. And I thought I would focus on speciesist bias, which is the thought of um, some species being superior to other kinds of species. Um, and focus on that as well as the reproducibility side of things. So um, I did a lot of brainstorming. What questions can I ask? How do I actually do this? How do I quantify this speciesist bias in the literature to showcase that this is actually important? Um, I've spent lots of hours looking for examples and templates of, peop of other people who've done similar work on other kinds of biases because no one does no one focuses on this kind as at least not as much for now. And another uh, objective was to publish results which for now are contained in GitHub, but I do look forward to publishing articles um, elsewhere as well. So did I actually achieve my goals? Kind of. <laughs> I ended up learning a lot more about how GitHub works, which will for sure be helpful for anything that I do in the future. I learned about licensing my work, which has been already extremely helpful. Um, I also learned about how to make science and my work more open and accessible, and I ended up making lots of really great contacts and reading a lot, which was extremely helpful. So as an outcome, I ended up having two, two, kind, two main projects that are kind of a side effect of my time in, your, in OLS. So first of all, I'm doing a project collaboration at the Turing Institute, and I'm looking for, forward to doing some keyword extraction to create some quantitative analysis of, of the speciesist bias that I was talking about. And I am also organizing a data hazards, ethics and reproducibility symposium on the 10th of March. It will be a hybrid event. So everyone is welcome to join. I am really looking forward to that and to applying all that I learned during OLS here. Um, and that is it. If you want to contact me, please email me. Um, and also feel free to come to the, to the event that I'm organizing or share it around as well. Well done. Congrats. Let's leave that QR code on the screen for a few. Oh. Oh. <laughs> share the link in the chat. It'll be great. Um, round of applause from everyone. Um, really exciting projects. And, and as a data has its enthusiast myself, um, please follow that link and join them. Um, next, we're going to be seeing the presentation where we had the mentor was Kim, and you're sharing the screen. Is that right?
Yes, that's correct. Can you see the screen all right? We see it great. Shall we okay. see if we can hear the recording? Hello, guys. Brilliant. Okay, I'm going to start it now. Go for it. Oh, uh, Megan Stock, Ariana Saborian, and Renee and Nina Rue. Thank you so much for attending our presentation. Due to personal commitments, we are unfortunately not all present at the graduation ceremony today, but we do hope that you enjoy hearing about our project. So before we jump into more about our project, let's start by making sure we're all on the same page regarding some of the common terms. A research software engineer, or RSC, is someone who uses software engineering abilities for research intensive purposes. They create software tools for researchers to use to improve their research. Interestingly enough, the first attempt at establishing an RSC group in Africa was only started last year, which is the RSC at Sun Initiative, founded by Dr. Kim Martin. So, what is the problem that we are trying to solve? Research quality is becoming highly dependent on intelligent and data-driven technologies to ensure its credibility, and thus, researchers need people who are able to help them in their projects, in other words, RSEs. So, the main goal of our project was aimed at creating a platform to bring domain specialists who have the capacity and willingness to help in open science, together with researchers from applied and social sciences who have needs to use computational technologies to investigate research problems together. In order to solve this research question, we decided that a semantic approach to developing the platform would be best. Semantic technologies overcome the problems presented by databases by creating a structured vocabulary where data can be organized regardless of how much data is added to it. This benefit of semantics was particularly important for us to make sure that the needs of the RSEs were met, since it allows for relationships between RSEs and their skills and abilities to be recorded, recorded explicitly, as well as for implicit relationships to be queried. Semantic technologies also allow for global collaboration between groups to be made possible. As you can see, we created an ontology that connects RSEs with researchers while focusing on the skills and technologies involved. Our ontology consists of five superclasses, each of which is made up of a few subclasses. The field class represents the different areas of research domain expertise that RSEs may have knowledge in and that projects require expertise in. The project class was created as a way to track projects that will be registered when the ontology is in use. The role player class contains subclasses of people, groups, or even machines that will be involved in the system. These include the client, RSE contact, and the specialist subclasses. The specialist is essentially someone in the system that is recorded as being able to provide RSE-like services without necessarily having to be classified as an RSE. The technology class was created to represent the skills and open source tools that RSEs are proficient in. Finding all the information needed to fill this ontology was challenging. Since RSEs are relatively new, common terms have not yet been established amongst them with many discrepancies between what certain things actually mean. Wait, are we on mute? <laughs> Just kidding. So in order to understand what RSEs are and what skills they have and the services they offer, we saw that with the help of the RSC at Sun founder, Dr. Kim Martin, we found ourselves being connected with many domain experts and RSC leaders who expressed their interest in our project and gave us many useful ideas. We set up a website, conducted multiple informal interviews, got accepted to a conference, and got interviewed for a podcast, all to be able to spread the word of the ontology and get as much RSE feedback as possible. When discussing our ontology with these specialists, they all had similar positive reactions towards our project and were excited about the benefits for its future use in collaboration. With the feedback from these domain experts, a couple of use cases were identified for potential future applications. Here are some Sparkle queries that show how our use cases are answered by the ontology. However, even with all these cool things about the ontology, our project doesn't end there. 
With the positive responses we have received from numerous people about our project and the potential for our ontology to be used by RSC groups and shared online, we've been encouraged to continue to develop the ontology and share it with enough RSEs so that it can become a community-driven and community-owned project that will grow legs and form a useful resource for many RSC groups. Hopefully, he will grow legs too. Possibly one of the coolest things that we were lucky to be a part of is the Open Life Science Mentorship Program. The OLS accepted our project as part of their program with the aim of helping us to develop our ontology under the open science movement through hosting it on GitHub and teaching us how to get the ontology to a point where it becomes community owned and driven. The most important aspect of this project is getting community feedback to ensure that the ontology is as relevant and inclusive as possible. In order to get the ontology to the point where it becomes a functional tool, additional steps will need to take place in the future, such as finding a way to make the tool openly available and easily updatable. As the exact approach that we plan on going about achieving this is still not completely certain, the search for the correct method continues as we learn more about how to share ontologies online and how to integrate them with existing technologies. Another plan for the future of the ontology is that one member of the team will potentially be visiting RSE groups in the UK in May this year to get facilitated input for the ontology. Also, we are preparing to host focus groups with RSEs who have insights into RSE skills, technologies and domains that they offer expertise in. Although we received much help from our mentor and from the OLS program, the development of the ontology was not without its challenges. We found that receiving valuable community input in a useful format was difficult as there was no easy way to get suggestions in a way that made it easy to implement into the ontology. Scaling the ontology has also been a challenge. We hoped to learn new tips and methods on how to adequately complete and implement an open science related project. We also hoped to learn more effective methods when it comes to conducting research. We expected to gain new knowledge from OLS by listening to what other people's projects were about and what their findings were, if they had any. Thank you so much for listening to us. We hope that we have inspired you to be part of this growing ontology and assisting researchers alike. And a huge congrats to Kim, who I think is the only person. Hello, guys. Uh, <laughs> our oh, others Megan. here. <laughs> Are others here or is it just Kim? Well, congrats. I hope Kim also you feel very proud of your team. I'm I'm um, extremely proud of them. It doesn't look like any of them are here. I don't think that's their own fault. I think there's a lot of stuff going on this side, including load shedding in South Africa, which is a different story altogether. But I am extremely proud of them. And a lot of love in the chats uh, for the uh, presentation. We'd all I think we all want to know how they did it. Um, I'm going to pass over to Yo now to close this exciting session. Okay, we have not managed a single one on time. Everyone's telling me don't forget to do group camera. I will do that after I have said thank you, I love you, and we turned off the streaming. <laughs> so just a quick thank you, everyone. It's been slightly over four months that we've been working together, that you've been working with your mentees, with your mentors, you've been working as a team. Um, it is not the end of our journey. Uh, we hope that many of you as mentees will be coming back as mentors maybe next time, or perhaps uh, as call facilitators, uh, people who help us host the calls and manage YouTube transcripts such as Ismail. Um, and we are so very amazed and proud of every single thing we've just seen today um, and of the other two presentation sets that we've had earlier this week. Um, and we will change culture together, step by step. Every one of you will make science just a little bit better shared so that we can build on each other's shoulders. And I am so proud, so, so proud of you. Um, Let's wrap up because we are over time. I'm going to stop the stream. Bye, beautiful YouTubers. We saw your support coming through. Sorry about the spam that came through in the YouTube channel. Um, and we will see you. I'm going to now, how do I make it stop? Ah.